let's talk a little bit about how weather forecasts are made because that was the big question that Larry and I were talking about. And even though we are not able to put the PowerPoint presentation on the screen with me sitting in front of it, this is basically how weather forecasts are made on the fly very quickly. And so let's get into the first slide. Uh, Larry, it's so important for everyone to to really understand the, the forecasting basics. You know, it takes an entire weather team in order to really get the not just the basics of, of forecasting, but using modern technology in order to predict the weather. Uh, many of us are are still used to kind of having our own techniques of forecasting the weather, and so when you inter introduce new technology, you know, it takes a a kind of a village in order to get all of the elements correctly because you have all these tools it doesn't necessarily mean the forecast is going to be any better uh, that being said you got to have the human touch and so we have you know the availability to generate several forecast models uh, due to modern technology but you still need uh, people like my chief meteorologist jerry tracy with the with the plethora of knowledge that he has his background his experience you can't do the weather i would trust a uh, a farmer's almanac or, or a generation of farmers before I would trust some of these forecast models sometimes. All right, Larry, you can go to the next slide. So to be a great forecaster, you know, you have to have, there, there really is no substitute for experience. You know, that's, that's, that's a huge thing right there is, is experience. And that's why, you know, we have there our chief meteorologists that, that we depend on, but being able to put the forecast into words and, and putting it into words that folks can really understand the general public that is, is something that comes with experience as well. And then you have to be able to speak different languages, you know, speak to the audience that, that are watching the news and, and what time of day people are watching the news. Uh, another thing about being a, a great forecaster is being able to see the, the atmosphere in, in four, four D, you know, four dimensions. And, and that fourth dimension is basically uh, talking about time. And so when we have tornadoes uh, outbreaks, usually, the bulk of them happen in the latter part of the afternoon. So we have to talk about, uh, you know, seeing the atmosphere, not just in 3D, but then taking time as that fourth dimension. So uh, taking all that into account, once we, you know, kind of see the atmosphere, that fourth thing that I go through is, is I have to visualize all of the different uh, weather elements that are in play. For instance, right now, depending on where you are specifically in Alabama, just, just at this moment, um, I don't know, because everybody is remote, there's a possibility that you could see some sunshine breaking through the clouds right now if you're in Chelsea or near the Grandview Medical Center camera. But if you're in Tuscaloosa, it's still, you know, low hanging clouds. And so, uh, you know, we're taking all of that into account when we're starting to build the forecast for midday today because we're going to see the weather changing. You know, everybody, if there's 70s in the forecast, I know folks know about it. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, just the day after National Palindrome Day, you know, the, the 2 2 2 2, two um, excitement, but the, uh, the temperatures will be in the mid 70s tomorrow and then in the 50s on Friday. So there's so many different weather elements that are happening today that uh, I have to kind of visualize what the rest of the forecast is going to look like into the weekend as well. The fifth one that I like to talk about is the correlating third thermodynamics and what the expected weather is. And so that's kind of put into the, the heating of the day. So if I know that, you know, we're gonna have temperatures right now, I believe the temperatures are actually quite mild in some locations. Right now, the temperature is at 69 degrees in Alabaster and it's 48 degrees in Haleyville, which is in Northwest Alabama. So just within three counties, it's 20 degrees colder. That's from the cold front. And so with the heating of the day, we know that the temperatures are probably going to rebound that would be the thermodynamics, likely going to rebound, but then we also expect to see our winds out of the south later today, which is going to heat up those temperatures by tonight, bringing us mid-70s tomorrow. So that sixth weather element uh, that we use to be a great forecaster would be our intuition. And I call that the sixth sense, if, if I had all five senses. Uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I don't have my taste and smell. <laughs> but the sixth sense uh, that I still think is intuition, that comes with experience. It comes with time. But a lot of it is just understanding in here in central Alabama, uh, I think the topography and and where the the creeks, rivers, and streams are located, what roadways tend to get flooded, you know, who sees this and who sees that. But all of those things come with forecasting different uh, weather 
weather patterns over a long period of time. You know, you have to, in order to see the climate, you have to have sections of either 10 years or 30 years. So you know, weather forecasting is just five to seven days out ahead of you. All right, Larry, you can head to the next slide. All right, so weather forecasting. And we were talking about 4D. Um, you know, even the most advanced forecasters, you know, they see the comprehensive 4D view of the atmosphere in our minds with that time being the, the fourth dimension. And it is a fact that weather, it just cannot be forecasted with any kind of reasonable accuracy beyond a week. Uh, many people can, can throw out guesses. Uh, they can look at climate patterns, climatology, like I mentioned, is the study of the atmosphere for long sections of time, like 10 years and 30 years. Um, and, and then you can also, like going back to some of the weather forecasting methods with experience, with knowledge, you know, uh, pinpointing certain subsections of Oak Mountain or uh, Double Oak Mountain or into uh, Smith Lake that may see a bit more of the uh, winter precipitation. Marion and Winston County, they always, uh, up I-22, tend to get a bit more of the white stuff when we have cold air moving in. So these are all little tidbits that meteorologists like myself, we keep in mind when we weather forecast, but we can not with any kind of reasonable accuracy forecast beyond about five to seven days. Uh, the accuracy level is down exponential. So even if I were to say in 10 days from now, it's going to be brisk or it's going to be windy or it's going to be cool, there's only a 30% probability that I'm going to be correct. And so I think it's, it's always important to talk about the weather, but to only uh, convey what I know and what I know to be a fact. All right. So just a couple of things, because I know what um, ha, ha, Larry gave me a little bit brief um, synopsis of, I, I guess, the, I don't know if the text didn't, didn't show up there, Larry, but um, yeah, there should be some text underneath that um, reasons for weather forecasting. So if you want to, for a moment, bring me back on camera, I will go through it um, just for a second, because I don't see anything on the screen. Hi, uh, you're still recording, right? We're good? Right, right. So uh, some of the reasons for weather forecasting, just to throw it out there, is, you know, it helps people on a very basic level to dress, right? You got to know how to dress. Um, it helps businesses plan for uh, power production. It, uh, you know, it helps people to prepare if they need to have extra gear, have an umbrella. It helps people to plan outdoor activities like, uh, you know, any kind of uh, concert or football game helping uh, businesses plan for transportation hazards. If you run a trucking company and you have to have all of your trucks you know, down, it helps people with health-related issues plan for their day, You know, heat stresses, allergies, uh, asthma, there are, um, certain medications, depending on whether they're exposed to heat. It helps people plan for severe weather. A lot of people have, uh, there's different types of phobias when it comes to weather. One of them in particular is a a fear of lightning that's called brontophobia. You know, there's many types of fears. And so it actually helps calm people's nerves to, to know what the weather forecast is going to be. And I totally understand that. So I answer lots of questions all the time. Um, it helps farmers and, and gardeners plan for crop irrigation, uh, protection from freezing. You know, usually the National Weather Service is an excellent guide uh, when talking about any kind of uh, preparation that may be a killing frost. Um, but it also helps, you know, people make, make money off of, uh, you know, skiing and boating, you know, local uh, uh, ballooning or whatever out there at uh, Pine Mountain, Georgia, uh, really cool. But you have to have very specific types of weather conditions in order to do things like ballooning or, or fly a plane. And so it certainly helps people uh, outside when they are trying to uh, battle wildfires. You know, the, there's a specific type of temperature that's measured when uh Forestry Commission goes out and does the controlled burns. It's called the wet bulb temperature. You know, they're very specific to the amount of moisture that's in the atmosphere in order to safely uh, burn things. Uh, it helps people to plan just for their day. If you just piddle around the house, maybe you want to fertilize, maybe you want to uh, spray for bugs, maybe you want to do some gardening or some lawn work. That's something that the weather is, is needed for. And so it, it really makes, I'd say to wrap it up, I'd, I'd say an uncertain future, just a little tiny bit more certain, the weather forecast, reasons for, for wanting to know the weather forecast. Okay, 
the last one, if you can pull it back up, there should be um, a couple of, of different things or six different things to talk about uh, the human touch about weather forecasting because a lot of people tend to use apps nowadays. Everybody has been using apps and I find myself um, either having to um, take up for the app or make excuses for the app one way or another, it's, it's basically the human being trying to go back and, and fix whatever the computer has generated. Because a lot of these um, apps are, they're outsourced through third parties and they may be providing accurate data, but they're constantly changing. It's a steady stream of information. So the weather forecast, it can change in a minute if it stops raining. Um, and so, you know, you may have a for forecast you pulled up in, on your app that says, Oh, it's going to be 75 degrees this afternoon, but it was already, you know, 75 degrees at noon and it's just going to get colder by three o'clock. You would see that in a human made uh, forecast because we know what the weather was the day before. A computer doesn't care about what the weather was the day before. It cares about the weather in the next hour. So some of the techniques that us human beings uh, use in order to forecast the weather would be a persistence. Uh, persistence, of course, is key, but that goes along with knowing what the forecast was the day before and knowing what the weather is out ahead of the next weather maker. Of course, we use a barometer. All sorts of different types of weather tools can be used. You know, Jerry Tracy is the one who told me, no matter what, I don't care if it's raining, even just a little bit before your show starts, just take a gander outside and look at the sky. A lot of times when we find ourselves inside the studio, uh, we don't end up going outside and, and looking at the weather, but there is certainly something to be said about what the weather feels like if you sit outside and close your eyes and listen to the wind blow and the birds chirp and, you know, feel the raindrops as they hit your skin. It, it helps you to describe and really um, understand Mother Nature. Now casting, that is a word that's pretty, pretty new, I'd say, and we say it sometimes within the broadcast, but since we you know, typically don't have that much time during a newscast to talk. Um, now casting is basically changing the weather forecast as we're talking. So, so when we're tracking severe weather, that would be now casting. So if we see a storm, a supercell that is, has the potential to produce a tornado, so they see the storm cell rotating, and then we know it's going 45 miles per hour towards the northeast, then I'm gonna forecast that it's going to be in Gardendale in 45 minutes. So me basically now casting, I'm taking what the weather's happening, what it's doing, and then I'm forecasting what it's going to do at that moment, in that moment, live and in real time. A uh, fifth technique, uh, using the forecast models. And we talked about this briefly at the very beginning. There are several different forecast models that we use, uh, different numbers that uh, input data into maps, um, I'll, I'll display one before we wrap things up and I'll give you a tour of the weather center too. But these forecast models, they, every, every uh, six to 12 hours, we run these forecast models, they change and they flip flop. They're not always consistent. Some of them are consistent and have been over the years, but more often than not, you use, need to use the human touch like persistence and now casting in order to you know, put the forecast models in. I use all of these together in, in one, uh, basically. So the analog technique is, is a complex way of making a forecast, requiring the forecaster to remember. And, and this is vital. And, and you, this is the end. So you can go ahead and put me back on um, camera, Larry, if you'd like. But the, the analog technique is basically how uh, Chief Meteorologist Jerry Tracy uh, does the weather. And it is so vital. It, it, really, it really is, especially when we are tracking severe weather and severe storms and and knowing and remembering certain storms and how they responded or, or he remembers, you know, during this time of the year in this particular weather setup, he just always tends to remember those particular uh, events. And then he can, we also utilize his skills and his expertise as a Rolodex, you know, so when we're in severe weather and doing severe weather situations, it, everything makes more sense when we have that Rolodex of information from our lead forecaster, which is Jerry Tracy. So uh, with that being said, we're going to right now, I'm going to give you guys a little tour here of the studio. Are you ready, Larry? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Is everyone sure. else ready? <laughs> okay. So let me see. I'm going to turn it around so I can do the 
you guys can see a flipped version. And, okay. and, if, and if you all want to click up there at the top on your speaker view, you'll get a bit of bigger picture of her doing this. Okay, yeah, and I'll wait one second if people do want to flip to that, because I'll take you guys into the studio. <clears throat> There's me and my my weekend people. You guys know those people, right? Yeah. And here's some more people. And then these are the people that you likely just saw this morning. Okay, so here's the studio. That's the good news because the on-air light's not on yet. All right, it's a little brighter in here. A tad bit brighter. Oh, somebody just clicked the on-air on light. Okay, so this is the studio, it's pretty big. But this particular area is the weather center. So we, we just talked about all the different forecast model modeling tools that we use. So if you look at the behind the scenes view of where I was just sitting, so I was sitting on this stool and I was had my phone in the tripod and I was controlling one, two, three computers at the same time. But the weather center in particular, we can control about 12 different computers. So this is the computer that we use in order to run the forecast models. There we go. This is the computer that we use to run the internet. This is the computer that runs the radar. And this is the computer that runs another social media outlet as well as the traffic computers. So let's take you back behind the scenes again. The big monitor and then back into the studio where all the anchors sit. So this is where the news anchors sit right here. And then after we come up with our weather forecast, we have to present it at the green wall. And so when we are looking at the forecast, we just see ourselves usually. There's a camera to the front, camera to the left. Oh, whoop. hello. Oh, like they pulled me up. Isn't that funny? You guys, the, the director has jokes. So they wanted to pull me up on the weather monitor. Hi guys, look at that. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so you can basically see what I see at this point. I just basically look at a mirror image of myself. Hello, Tom. One of our, our bosses is coming in here, I presume getting ready for some kind of interview. You have something going on? All right. So training is about to start right now inside the studio. And that's the tour of the studio. Harmony, I have a question. Yes. How much do you all depend on NOAA for your forecasting? The National Oceanic and Atmospheric, I don't depend on anybody to do my forecast except for myself. I, so, I, mean, I mean, you don't look at, at what their models show or anything? I, I don't. I mean, I, I look at forecast models that NOAA does provide information. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric our Administration does provide information, but I don't personally, I don't read forecast models to try to uh, do their forecast. I, I don't uh, use anyone else's information but my own. Uh, I, I you look. I look at numbers, forecast maps, and decipher what I think in my team thinks is going to be the right forecast. But okay. I don't look at anyone, uh, anyone else's information. I actually, whenever people um, come into the studio and they ask me about the weather, sometimes people I like to call it uh, suggestive forecasting. Sometimes people will say it's going to snow right or it's going to get bad tonight right and i'm like are you asking me or are you telling me because i don't want anyone to tell me it's it's a science project almost like creating a hypothesis and I, uh, I, I consider those to be negative variables if i were to read anyone else's information but at the end of the day now that all is said and done i i could tell you that if you're an if you're a good meteorologist you should come up with the same conclusion as everyone else without having to read anyone else's notes it's like a math equation, you know, if, if you look at the, the numbers and if you read the numbers accurately and you put all the weather elements together, you should be singing the same song. And lately we have been, which is excellent for communication because weather is not something that should be 
subjective or something that should be withheld. It should be, you know, universal. So, so what is the hardest type of weather to predict? Around here, I guess it would be winter precipitation, but I don't have a problem predicting winter precipitation myself. Uh, but I think a lot, a lot of the reasons why people underestimate the power of winter weather here is due to the topography and, and how people um, have to get around in central Alabama. You, you don't realize how flat you know, Illinois is until you're there in the cornfields. And of course they can handle snow because they're not trying to go uphill, you know, or up a mountain. Uh, so I think our, our geographical disposition is why specific winter precipitation can be very difficult to predict. If anybody else wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead. I'll ask, uh, or ask a question. I understand that you get a for the weather temperature forecast, you get a direct feed from the National Weather Service and you just plop it in, so to speak, that you're not really involved in deciding what the temperature is going to be two days, three days, four days out. Is that right? That is not correct. No, we have a, an Excel spreadsheet from which we enter in numbers and we create our own forecast. Now there are apps that fill that out and they're constantly changing and we even have an app but there's always a human touch to our weather forecast so ours is not plug and play no harmony when mm -hmm. you are broadcasting is there a blank uh, behind is that actually a map or is it or i remember years ago that the the um, it's right here in the screen i just walked past it you see the green wall Yes, is that what you, is that what, but we don't see that. Right, right there. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that, we see a map. Right, it's called uh, chroma key. So the, 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 the weather graphics that we have in our computer screens, they're displayed behind us using uh, chroma key technology. So you can see it, but behind you is still a green, uh, mm -hmm. behind I think you is a green, but, but we in the, in the audience see a map. Yeah, I think they just, I think they still have it pulled up. I can show you. Oh. Well, why, why is that? Why don't you have a map right behind you? Well, the weather changes. And I mean, and a lot of times, okay, so you can see me here. Yes. You can see me in front of it, but um, so I look at myself here and the basic premise behind having a map in front of me would be me standing in front of the monitor because this this isn't green this is an actual monitor and we do stand in front of it sometimes and a lot of times they have these smart screens nowadays that people stand in front of but um weather moves weather changes it can't be stagnant it has to move so it's either going to be displayed on chroma key or it's going to be displayed on a monitor because it has it has to move it has to animate but when you're standing in front of a green screen and you're looking at the map to tell us where, what, how do you, how do you pinpoint, how do you point out if you're, if you're right in front of that green screen and that's what we're looking at, how, how do you, how do you figure out where um, to point at the green screen? Well, how do you look in there and put visine in your eyes? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, She's yeah, looking at she's looking at monitors on either side and like, below the like, camera. Like if you were to pluck eyebrows or do that like this, how else would you know except you're looking at yourself? Okay. You know what I mean? Like you just practice looking at yourself in the mirror. Like if you look in the mirror and you start to move your hands a certain way, it may not really register right out the gate that I'm pointing at this light until I get used to it. You see what I'm saying? So I know like there's the desk, there's the light but only because I've gotten used to it, looking in the mirror and being able to manipulate how my body moves with the mirror. But same premise as to looking in the mirror. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes, I have one. Mm -hmm. uh, Harmony, did, you, did I hear you say that most tornadoes happen in the afternoon? Typically, they happen in the late afternoon, mm -hmm, late afternoon and early evening. And that's basically like uh, in comparison, you know, the atmosphere has a lot of latent heat, especially in the spring 
you know, in late summer, those transitional seasons. So tornado season, this is severe weather awareness week this week, by the way. And we have two specific tornado seasons. One would be in the spring and one would be in the fall. Uh, that's our secondary tornado season. But these tornado outbreaks, when they occur, it's basically like a pot of boiling water, that latent heat I was just talking about in the atmosphere. With the heating of the day, we slowly but steadily continue to boil that water real slow like until it starts to bubble up and, and blow over. And when the water in the atmosphere becomes so buoyant that it starts rotating, convecting in the atmosphere, that's why they call those overshooting anvil tops that bust through the stratosphere in the atmosphere, creating those large cumulonimbus clouds that generate supercells that can have rotating columns. That happens because of a couple of weather elements, not just, uh, you know, these big cold fronts or these upper level features. You got to have the heating of the day and you got to have that southerly flow in order to really crank out uh, some of those tornadoes. But it usually takes a lot of heat and you only get that with the heating of the day up until about 6 p.m. And sometimes when you have overnight storms, usually that's from upper level features that don't require the heating of the day. You mentioned that um, if everybody uses the data correctly, you generally come to a consensus. However, when you see um, these multiple tracks for predictions of pathways of hurricanes, they oftentimes are spread on both sides of Florida and bizarre differences. Mm -hmm. Over time, why haven't they figured out which one's right, which one's wrong, or combined the data so that it's more consistent? That's an excellent question. And I can tell you right now that it still does uh, boil down to, we should be singing the same tune, but the way that, that this, these graphics are displayed, like the cone of uncertainty is what they call it, right? And one, one of the big controversies was Sharpie Gate you know, with, you know, Trump putting the Sharpie and it's all about the cone. Okay. So, but there's only a couple of weather graphics makers that us meteorologists use on TV in order to display this information, you know? So how do you, when you see the maps, how it's displayed, how you look at it, how the information comes in. Well, that cone, when we talk about it, you know, and we, and we disseminate that information to the public, it's our responsibility to say, now look at the cone, imagine a cone. Okay. And the cone means that the eye wall, and then you'll see that line on the cone, right? There's, there's lines on that particular cone. And so what the meteorologist should say that it's very important to understand that these lines represent that the eye wall can be as far west as such and such, or as far east as such and such. You understand what I'm saying? So that's a basic average. So that's why you'll see meteorologists, if they're good and they have the time, show the spaghetti plots because then you'll see the spaghetti models. You'll see one over here, one over here, one over here. Well, three, four of those spaghetti models may be specific to a one graphic, you know? And, and a lot of times because of social media and the way that information is disseminated nowadays, people are looking for clickbait. They want to scare you. They're trying to make you scared and manipulate you. For why? It's certainly not for meteorological purposes, but I can guarantee you that if it's displayed correctly, we should all be saying the same thing. Now, people, again, they make guesses, they roll the dice. Those graphics are the program to and designed, Larry was mentioning about NOAA, the Hurricane Center, the National Hurricane Center and NOAA, the hurricane graphics, those are specifically fed through NOAA hurricane graphics in specific. So, so you know what he was asking what they're used for. They're very useful during hurricane season, but just as a guideline, not as a forecaster. They're just giving us guidelines. They're, they're not giving us a way to display that information or you know, telling us how to tell you. They're just giving us a map and telling us to tell you. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we're saying the right information. But if you break it down, and really have folks understanding with each forecast model run so they're not scared what each detail means, then we would be singing the same song. We should be. You really have to be very quick in looking at those graphs in order to um, give us immediate information. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that, I guess you're trying to be very quickly 
how many screens do you have to look at in order to make a, a, an accurate or hopefully an accurate prediction? For a tropical weather um, forecast? Well, I mean, usually we can see the, the uh, tropical waves coming off of the African coastline and moving through the Atlantic Ocean. And we have five to seven days to plan for a potential landfall hit into Puerto Rico. And so if you, if you, the general public, the citizen, is one of the people that says, I don't get on my phone, I don't like my computer, I don't get on Facebook, I don't watch TV, whatever your excuses or reasons or whatever it is, if you didn't pay attention to the weather for five to seven days and there's a hurricane in the Gulf, chances are five to seven days we were talking about a hurricane in the Gulf. And so it, it, it's, it's really hard It's with news and weather because it gets very overwhelming too even for myself, when weather becomes news, it takes on a different life of its own, you know, but the climatology and the weather behind hurricane forecasting, we can see and we do know at least a week before it even makes its way landfall, but we can't force people to look at their phones or turn on their TV every day of every week. So speak of, speaking of that, I understand that the sirens are going to be decommissioned or going to stop the weather sirens, but I heard them previous, you know, like a week ago, I heard them going at the same time we were getting alerts on our phones. Has anybody done an analysis that there are a lot of people who will not be getting the alerts on their phones or computers and they're going to be lost if, if the sirens are decommissioned? I know, and the sirens did go off this morning, I believe at nine o'clock, the National Hurricane Center or the National Weather Service rather in Birmingham um, did send out because this is hurricane or it's national, you know, severe weather awareness week. And so today they did send out a, um, a test testing signal at nine o'clock this morning. I hear the sirens all the time. I heard them on Thursday um, and I'm in the Hoover area. The, the siren system is I still think very valuable. I'm always an advocate for it, but it's specifically designed for people that are outside. That's the bottom line. If you're not outside, then it's useless for you. You so have to be why, out. Why are they stopping them? I am certain that it, they have the sirens that are connected through the county, through the polygon system now. It used to be countywide warnings, and now they're specific warnings for specific areas because of, of the way that we have breaking, broken down uh, warnings now. But they're all run specifically by every city and municipality. It's not all the county's issue. It's politics. Main tornado alley. Well, that's that excellent question. You know, uh, the first week of March, the um, a lot of us emergency managers from the National Weather Service, um, emergency management agency, Jefferson County EMA, uh, several other meteorologists, uh, including um, from different television stations, we're going to be talking about the potential for you know scientists to back uh, the the movement or placement of Tornado Alley and suggest that it is now encompassing more of the Southern states rather than uh, the Midwest. And so we're about to present, it's called the Vortex Project. Um, I've been in, in cahoots with several other meteorologists over the past, uh, I guess, decade. Um, ever since, honestly, since in 2011, you know, I, I've, I've been here since 2010, but since 2011, not only have we had several advances in technology, but uh, several meteorologists also are in, you know, in this project called the Vortex Project that hopefully, you know, we can shine more light on the fact that we are seeing more widespread, more frequent uh, tornadoes here to, uh, to pinpoint us being the new tornado alley. So there's several meteorologists and, and EMA um, directors that are involved in trying to, to scientifically prove that right now. It seems like that the tornado path seems to go the same way every time it happens. Right, I mean, generally weather moves from Southwest to Northeast. And so, I mean, that's why we put our WBTM 13 live Doppler radar in advance um, and, and pointed it towards the Southwest because you see those shrieks and they look just like lines that are almost oriented, I guess, at the same uh, direction like 459 or 5920 when it's out 
from Southwest to Northeast. And that's just the way that basic weather patterns gen generally move throughout the South and the way that the jet stream rolls through, everything moves, weather moves from west to east. Um, you know, the only time that that doesn't occur is when we have tropical weather features that nudge the entire atmosphere westward. Hi. <clears throat> I'm almost so done. Does, it, does it go in that direction because the uh, weather from the Gulf pushes it up? Right. So if just for instance, if there was a tropical weather feature that was in the Atlantic and it's been sunny here for days, right? It's been nice and dry and sunny. And then you start to see a tropical weather feature nudging into the Carolinas. And some people may say, oh, it's coming to Atlanta, but then it's just breezy and sunny all day and it goes into New England. You know, so it's, it, it creates a pressure gradient certainly. So it's not strong enough to move because it doesn't have upper level support. Typically the, the jet stream contracts into the Northern tier of the nation as we approach hurricane season. And that's the driving upper level conveyor belt, so to speak, the jet stream. And when it contracts back into Canada, it opens up the atmosphere. And so there's no real driving mechanism. So we have beautiful weather, tropical weather feature comes in and our weather kind of bounces it back up into the Eastern seaboard. And we just end up with breezy conditions, but you'd have to know what the weather was like for the week or two prior in order to get that right. You know what I mean? Or at least I do. Any other questions? Well, Carmony, we've really enjoyed this. This <laughs> opened up my eyes quite a bit to your what you work with there. And thank you for joining us. Hey, do you want to meet Rick Carley? He just came in the studio. Hey, sure. Rick. Yeah. Come here. I have some people that I want you to say hi to. <coughs> well, I'm on a Zoom call. <laughs> You guys know who Rick Carley is, right? He's kind of a big deal around here. <laughs> Rick Carley he's, used to. He used to he used are you entering midday with me, sir? Come on over he's, here. I'm doing a, a Zoom call with New Horizons. This is Mr. Larry Roddick. This is Rick Carley. Yeah, hey, folks. How are hey, you? Rick. How are you? Yeah. You doing yeah, right? you, 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 you used to be my sports guy years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 39. Uh, uh, 10 years before I came to Birmingham, then 30 here. So 41 years as a sports guy and then two and a half years. So I'm in my 43rd year. Yeah. But you're only two to me. Yeah. I look like I'm 29 <laughs> to Harvey. He does. Well, that's Mr. Rick Parley. We're about to do midday. Okay. I presume that's why he's in here. Yeah. What are you doing? In here? I'm helping our new teleprompter operators read some news. Ooh. All right. We all have a good day. Okay. okay. Good to see you. Yeah, if you have any if you have any compliments, you come right to me. And if you have any complaints, go right to Harmony. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see. It's the complaint department. The weather department is usually the complaint department. Well, you all do a great job and thank you again for joining us. And I know you're you have to run off now, but uh, take care. Okay, thanks, Larry, and thank you guys everyone for your time. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Um yeah, as I explained before we got started today, uh, th this this had to change kind of last minute because of some things they threw at her uh, that had to do with the weather today and yesterday and today. So um, I appreciate the fact that she was able to give us as much time as she did. Uh, Ellen, I don't know if we want to just leave it open since we're it's kind of early still and see if anybody has any questions that they want to uh, ask or do you think we should just uh, end the meeting now oh you're muted ellen you're you're muted yeah, yeah. whoops that uh if anybody has any suggestions or questions about anything new horizons i didn't mention at the beginning maybe some of you were not here that uh, our our medical people uh are advising us not to have the brunch to start off our in-person meetings on March 16th and not to have uh, snacks for our in-person meetings. I hope everyone is okay with that, but uh, just wanted to let you know our thinking uh, of the executive committee and our, our other, other folks uh, who uh, put these uh, programs together is that okay we're trying to be 
sensitive to the COVID and to the church because we, we we're meeting at the church too, and mm -hmm. uh, we want to be responsible. Okay. Again. So, anybody have any? Is that okay? I have, I have a question. Uh, um, when when we go to in person meetings, uh, are the in person meetings going okay. to be? limited to in-person or have we in investigated uh, having a combined uh, all, an alternate uh, so that people who uh, for whatever reason I mean we have people who tune in who are from out of town who wouldn't be able to come to the in-person meetings um, who attend on zoom uh, have we looked at doing uh, a, a meeting that is allows both zoom and in person at the church that's uh that's a technology question and i would have to defer to all of our technologists whether we can do an in person and do a zoom at the same time that's that i i i don't know i know um I know the biology department. I was just at a seminar. They did, and uh, they, they did. I was at there in person, but they Zoom at the same time. So I know it's technologically possible. I guess it depends on if we can access uh, their internet with our equipment, because you have to have internet access to, yeah. to do. Helen, um, let yeah, let me let me let me comment on that. Uh, uh, I had suggested that we do both uh, some time ago and uh, looked into how to do it, talked to uh, someone who has done it, that, that that's of the, uh, the president of the Hoover Historical Society. They've done both uh, at their meetings. And I think it is possible, but I'm going to, uh, I have to check with the church to make sure that there is good internet connectivity down there. Uh, because that would be the key to it. And I plan to do that this week. Uh, and hopefully I'll get back to you about what I find out about that. Uh, as far as equipment, the only piece of equipment that we'd have to get is a camera slash audio device that can pick up the speaker and, uh, you know, uh, and then we, we could do the Zoom as well as the regular meeting. I know Don uh, uh, had had some concerns about doing Zoom with the regular meetings, and I and I understand some of what he's saying, but I, I still think there is some value in in having it uh, uh, both ways uh, for people who can't make it or decide that they don't want to 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 to, to take a chance on it. So I, I mean, I, this is a decision for for. For the, you all, I mean, for the board to make, but I, but I don't think we have enough information yet. So let me let me do a little more collecting of the information, and then I thought we could um, talk about it at a board or executive committee meeting, if that's all right with you. I'll, I'll just mention that it's not very successful in my experience if you try to use a laptop, even if you use a laptop with the speaker and audio uh, like you get on a laptop because once you get the dis the speaker gets at a little bit of a distance, then the video part and the speaker part and the audio part falls apart. So the, the laptops and the laptop speakers that you can get as an external speaker designed for somebody sitting right in front of it. So you have to be sure that what you're doing is a setup that will handle that. Uh, testing, testing, testing. So I recommended with one group that they test it out first. They did not do that and they had problems all throughout the, the meeting uh, because they were trying to do a laptop. So you, you really have to work it out ahead of yeah. time and do a lot of testing of it uh, ahead of time in my opinion. Yeah, James, uh, James I, 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 I agree with you and we actually talked about that and we talked about going down there and doing a test. Jim, I'm so concerned about what I'm doing. 
uh, has has made it work for his group. But he said you have to you have to get pretty close up to the speaker with the camera. You've got to get close enough to to pick up the speaker, and then you've also got to ask the speaker not to roam around too much, <laughs> and that's somewhat limiting for some speakers. So, so there are some issues with it. Uh, and then also don't forget that for questions from the audience, the in-person audience, you've got to have somebody close to the computer or speaker who is repeating those for people because it doesn't pick up across the room usually. So yeah, just another thing to think about. That's right. And, uh, this is Jerry Brown. Uh, has, has the decision definitely been made that we're going to meet uh, in person? <clears throat> well, that's a question for Ellen. I, I don't, I don't I think do. exactly. Yeah. 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 I am depending on the board, the executive board, this is Jerry Brown and Larry Roddick and Elizabeth uh, Willis uh, and myself uh, uh, to, to make that decision. Uh, I think I wrote an email to you a couple of days ago. So I depend on guys to, uh, uh, and uh, as part of the executive board, to make a decision. Right now, my feeling is from the feedback I've been getting is that we want to try in person meetings. Well, will we be able to get an email schedule uh, that's printable, like we usually do, of uh, the events and where they're going to be and what time and so on and so forth? I think Kathy was going to send that out uh, around March around March first. Am I correct? Oh, so so we will be getting a schedule. That's printable, right? On email. Yeah, there's a plan for that, uh, Ron. I think. Yeah. Once, once the decision is made. Yeah. The answer to the question that was asked is the decision, the firm decision, is still pending. Yeah, I think we're still collecting information, and and it'll be about another week probably before the, or, you know, within this next week, I guess we need to decide. <laughs> also, <clears throat> there are. There are other uh, determinations to be made besides the technology of having dual type meetings. Ollie here in Birmingham is doing classes both in person and online. Okay. Yeah, I think there are there lots of venues where they're trying it and and like james said sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't it it uh, you really do have to get the uh, work out the the issues with the with the technology i mean the technology exists to do it well um, you know obviously the church has to have or wherever the meeting occurs has to have internet access and obviously if it's uh, Ethernet connectability in the room where it's being done, that's ideal. Uh, if they have Wi Fi, it depends on how good their Wi Fi is. But clearly, if you have a, an effective camera and an effective microphone, um, you can do it and do it well. But you know, you need the right equipment and you know, webcams that we put on our PCs don't generally suffice in a room where somebody's walking around. There's also the problem of background noise. Right. Because I've but, been involved in book clubs where we couldn't hear anybody because the background noise was so bad. It picks up. I, I think it, it all depends on the, again, the camera equipment and the microphone equipment. And the equipment to do it well exists. Uh, not everybody has access to it. And that, that may be something the club wants to uh, consider investing in if that's 
something that uh, is needed. It, it seems doubtful that COVID is going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And the question really is what the risks involved are. Well, I guess you all know too, or if you've kept up with the latest on COVID that uh, there's a new variant called BA2 out there that's uh, hitting certain places pretty hard. It's not, it's not, across the US yet, but it's into, it's into North Carolina, I understand, and some other states. And it can be more severe than the Omicron was. So we, we we're definitely not out of the woods with this yet. That's for sure. And, and it appears that that variant is not necessarily uh, protected against vaccine wise. Yeah. So with all of that, it's the joy of making these decisions, right, Ellen? <laughs> well, uh, we don't have decision. I am more concerned about Rowena and, and Kathy. I keep them involved in all of this because they're the ones that set up the, the, the curriculum and, uh, and the, they, they set up these programs. Uh, and, and, uh, and Don, are, they have the... Uh, the certification to set these and so I, 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 we try to keep them in the loop but we're, we're going to have to board it's going to have to make decision one i guess the first thing we need, do we want to try in-person meetings starting march 16th and if they know and everything we go back to zoom again that that, that decision have in-person meetings uh we come in, we are fully vaccinated, three shots. We wear an N95 mask, no hugging, no kissing, no, no kissing, but anyway. Uh, uh, and we, we try to socially distance and, uh, and, and, uh, and try to fellowship as much as we can. Those are the decisions that we have to look at. So, I will be emailing the board again, the executive board, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go along with, with what their best judgment on whether we meet in person or whether we go back. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to find out more about the church's uh, internet uh, ability to uh, Ellen, and, and so I'll, yeah, I that, should do that. that. Would be great, Larry. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's about all we can do today. So I, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for continuing to include the UAB retirees mailing list in your notices. That's been very helpful. I want to really thank you for Zoom. That has been wonderful. When you're, you can't go. <laughs> Um, okay. We have, we, <laughs> we have a great group. I love it. Are we ready to hang it up today? I think we're ready to hang it up. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> tomorrow is uh, is Nikki Sepsis uh, talking about Barcelona. So join us tomorrow. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.